I'm thrilled to be here with you to talk about change leadership. Um, it's one of my favorite topics, and I believe that it's a tool as leaders that's more important today than ever before. After the events of 2020, I can't think of a leader that hasn't had to deal with change leadership. I wanna share with you a little roadmap of what to expect today. I'm going to highlight why I believe change leadership is really important here in 2021 and beyond. I'm also gonna share with you some tools that you could use to help facilitate and lead your organizations through change. And I'm gonna share with you some ph phenomenon that you witnessed during the change process so that we could be aware of it and have a better sense of what to expect. Finally, I'm gonna talk about the intersection of emotional contagion and emotional intelligence and how those play out in the change process. So what is change? To become different, to transform, right? Much like the butterfly. And change and innovation is something that's all around us. I would say it's fair to say, as you look to the future, change is ahead, right? At this time, it's my belief that there's two types of organizations in this world. There are the organizations that are out there doing the disrupting, that are really changing the marketplace, or the type of organizations that are being disrupted, that are being caught on their heels, right? So at this point in time, you're either disrupting or you're being disrupted. And let's talk about some examples. Here's the first one, right? Quintessential example of an organization that was completely disrupted, right? Blockbuster video, right? Used to be a hallmark of any metropolitan area. You know, I remember Friday night after work rushing over to Blockbuster because I want to get that last copy of the new release, right? It was a huge part of um, our community, our society, our life here in the United States. Um, but what you see on the slide behind me is now the world's last Blockbuster in Bend, Oregon, which is more probably of a novelty destination than anything else. It was completely disrupted. What was it disrupted by? Well, first Redbox, then Netflix, the streaming service, Disney Plus, right? Apple TV, HBO Max, so on and so forth, right? Completely disrupted the marketplace. Let's look at another example. Yellow cab, right? Synonymous with New York City. It's not like there aren't taxi cabs anymore, but they have been totally disrupted by the ride sharing industry, Lyft, Uber, and others, right? Again, one organization is being disrupted, that or other organization is doing the disrupting. One more example, what about big box stores? Sears, right? There was a time when, you know, working at Sears was seen as a very, um, very important job, a very respected job. Um, Sears was, you know, just a, a piece of America, right? The Sears catalog, anyone remember going through the Sears catalog and um, bookending pages, like making your Christmas list? Um, but these big box stores and ones like Sears specifically have been totally disrupted by organizations such as Amazon, right? And the irony is, is Sears was perfectly placed to be the Amazon of the future, right? They had the inventory, they had the products, they had a catalog. They just needed to go into e-commerce, but they didn't. And as such, they were completely disrupted. And now Amazon has skyrocketed. As I look at this, these are just a couple of more extreme examples. But again, you're either being disrupted or you're doing this disrupting. And if you left it up to me, I'd much rather be with Netflix and Lyft and Amazon than be over here with Blockbuster, Yellow Cab, Sears, and Kmart, right? So I wanna share another analogy for this. It's a story about the internet, strangers, and your mom. I know, kind of a strange storyline, right? When I was a kid, the things I was told by my mom was, don't talk to strangers, and absolutely never get in or near a stranger's car. As I think about the next generation of kids, they start being told, don't talk to strangers on the internet. But now it went from don't meet people using the internet or get into strangers' cars to use the internet to get into a stranger's car, right? So it is totally disrupted how we do things. So as leaders, we have to realize that change leadership is something that we're gonna have to do, because if not, we're gonna find ourselves on our heels and we don't wanna be the, the next Sears. The thing is, as leaders, many of us are seen to be at the top of our field, right? We're experts in the field. Um, we got to this leadership role for a reason. Yet what I found is that even some of the best leaders in the field 
have made many mistakes and haven't been able to see the future. So I want to share with you a couple of examples. So this is a quote who said this, everything that can be invented has been invented. I mean, who could have possibly thought that? Well, this was Charles Duell, who is the commissioner of patents in 1899. I mean, clearly not the case, right? But this is somebody who is a leader in their field. Their mind would be boggled if they saw an iPhone, I'm sure. Next one. There is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Who said this? Kenneth Olson. He was the president and founder of Digital Equipment Corp. Remember when computers were supercomputers, they were huge, they were used by businesses. Digital Equipment Corp, obviously not a household name today because Apple, IBM, others did see the future of the personal computer and that's why they took over the market share. What use could this company make of an electric toy? So this is William Orton, who was the Western Union president, who turned down the opportunity to, to, to purchase Alexander Graham Bell's struggling telephone company. What use could the company make of an electrical toy? Could you imagine a world without a telephone these days? A couple more examples. Stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Hopefully no one's saying that right now. This was a professor of economics at Yale University on October 17th, 1929. Again, folks that were experts in their field, but that could not see the future, could not see that there was disruption in front of them. Two more. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Well, we know that's obviously not the case. I mean, my nine-year-old could stare at his iPad for hours on end, it feels like. This was the head of 20th century, 20th century Fox in 1946. And what do we know about Fox? It's really kind of the fourth network, right? It was really behind on the network TV. Um, you know, it didn't keep up with the CBS, ABC, NBC. And part of it might have been this leadership that couldn't see the future and didn't make the investment um, into the television market. All right, final one. Probably one of the worst business decisions of all time. This was a company that said, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on their way out. This was Decca Records rejecting the Beatles in 1962. Huge, huge business mistake, hundreds of millions of dollars. So again, as leaders, I wanna encourage you to do two things. You need to think about, am I disrupting or am I being disrupted? But also, do I need to step back and see a future that might look different than the one that I'm envisioning right now? So let's talk, how do we become future thinkers? And how do we help lead these change initiatives in our organizations? Well, one reason we don't lead them often is because they don't succeed a lot, right? And one of the things I wanna help you with today is give you some tools to help increase the success of your change initiatives. Many authors have documented that up to 70% of change initiatives fail, right? Let, let that sink in. Seven out of 10 change initiatives fail. This is why change leadership has such a bad name. This is why people are afraid to lead change, afraid to take risk, right? If you're gonna fail 70% of the time, right? You're gonna be um, pretty scared to do it. But here today, what I wanna focus on is how can we actually replicate? What can we learn from the change leadership initiatives that are successful 30% of the time? And how can we help increase our success if this if, you, if in organizations within our nation are 70% failure, 30% success, how do I help get my organization reverse of that? Maybe 70% success. What do I need to do? Well, first you need to understand the formula for change. I wanna introduce this concept here to you on the screen. There's these elements of change, right? That must be present. First, D, dissatisfaction with the status quo. Right? There must be dissatisfaction with the status quo within your organization, within your marketplace, those who you serve, your clients, your customers. Secondly, V, you must have a vision for change. Dissatisfaction alone is simply not enough to lead to change. You actually need to have a vision for where we're going to go. And finally, third, F, first steps. Right? You can't just have a big lofty vision without any first steps. It doesn't mean you need to have every step. 
oftentimes some of the best things are launched without clarity on how they're going to get there, but they have some first steps. You know where you're going to start. And eventually, does that D, V, F, is it greater than R, resistance, the resistance to change? As I look at my dissatisfaction with the status quo, my vision for change, and my identified first steps, are those greater than the resistance to change that exists in my organization, with my clients, my customers? If so, your change initiative can succeed. So how does small change develop into large change, right? Change always starts somewhere, and it's often with a small group. So I wanna share this concept with you called the diffusion of innovation. This is by Rogers going back to the 1960s. So this is a 50-year-old concept, but it still holds true today. What you'll see on this slide is a standard bell-shaped curve. And what you see is that there's different groups of individuals in these percentages of adoption. So you have that 2.5% of individuals who are the innovators. They're basically willing to try anything. We know who they are. They're willing to try anything, and many of those things don't succeed or ever really take on. The next group is the early adopters. This is a really important group. I like to uh, mention them as a, a first follower. They see the innovators and they're like, you know what, that is a good idea. I want to be part of that. I want to try that. And you know who these folks are in your organization. And if you don't, you need to know who are my innovators and who are my early adopters because you're not going to be able to make change without identifying those folks and getting them on your side, on board with your change initiative and moving along. And those first two groups, you know, they're usually pretty open to change. They like change. They like new things. They like innovation. But this next group, getting into that early majority is really critical. And they actually call the line between the early adopters to the early majority. It's referred to commonly in organizational development literature as the chasm. And this idea of crossing the chasm. How do I get from those folks who are comfortable with change and innovation and willing to try new things and jump that chasm and get my early majority involved? Because once my early majority involved, it's really all downhill from there. Then my late majority comes on, on board. And then the laggards, you know, they might not come on board for years, but eventually they have no other choices but to get on board. The laggards can't go to Blockbuster anymore, right? They have to get on board with that. Um, they have to get on board with additional approaches. So I want to share an example. This is really the adoption of the smartphone. We'll use the iPhone specifically as an example. And this was the diffusion of innovation for smartphones and the iPhone in general. So early on, back in 2008, you had those innovators, 2.5% of the population. I know personally I was one of those individuals that waited in a long line to get my iPhone, right? I'm an, I'm an innovator. I do like to try new things. I like new tech. But I also remember there's challenges that went with that. You know, the iPhone 1 didn't work that great. It always had service issues, right? Because the network wasn't built up, right? And so oftentimes as an innovator, the world actually hasn't caught up with what you're trying to do. Then there was the early adopters, right? More people getting on board in that next year, getting the smartphones. And then eventually we jumped that chasm and we got to the early majority. And again, what do we know? Once the early majority is involved, it's only a matter of time till the change takes over. Finally, on to the late majority. And then at last we had the laggards, right? And we still had those flip phones around. My 90 plus year old grandmother had a flip phone, but they're basically a dinosaur now and hard to find, right? The laggards basically get pulled in because they have no other choice, right? The marketplace has moved on. So when you think about achieving that tipping point and working your way through the diffusion of innovation, you need to be mindful of the first follower. And the first follower is to me a very important leadership concept. And so much focus is given to the leader, right? The leader is always put up on a pedestal. The leader is most important. But I would contend to you of equal importance is that first follower, the first one that says, I am compelled by that vision and I am going to follow you. I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with you and get on board with this idea. And so I really want you to think about sometimes being a change leader actually just means being a first follower. Or sometimes when you are a change leader, you're desperately seeking those first followers that are willing to stand, stand with you and jump into the change. Let's take a look at a video that tells us a fun and unique story of first followership. 
If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public. Be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Every time I watch that video, I get a chuckle, um, especially the first follower, right? You know, it's so awkward, but he gets in there and then it just spreads like wildfire and suddenly everyone is on board. And so let this be a reminder to you that sometimes being a great leader is being a good first follower. So I wanna share some readings with you throughout this presentation to encourage you to go back and look into deeper. Um, the first one that I'll share is The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, this is one of my favorite books, read it multiple times. And it really talks about how does change tip, right? What leads to that magic moment? This quote from Malcolm Gladwell, the tipping point is that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold tips, and then spreads like wildfire. What Gladwell identifies is it's not the majority that leads to the tipping point. It's actually a small group of individuals that have a significant impact, right? They're your connectors, right? Those, they're the folks that are maybe your early adopters that are out there. And so as an organizational leader, you need to think, who could help me tip this change in my organization? Who's going to be my ambassadors of the change? Right, so again, looking back at the diffusion of innovation, you know, I, I really think about as you get past those early adopters, jumping that chasm into the early majority, that's when things tip. They don't tip at the top of the bell-shaped curve. It's already done at that point. Once you get into that early majority, that's your tipping point typically. All right, another resource is Start With Why by Simon Sinek. In addition to the book, there's also a TED Talk. This is the most watched TED Talk ever. And what's interesting about this TED Talk, it's almost watched twice as much as the second most watched TED Talk. So this is a very famous TED Talk. Um, we're not gonna watch it all here today, but I do wanna share a brief excerpt with you. I call it the golden circle.
Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? So that's just an excerpt of the Start With Why TED Talk. I would encourage you to take the time to watch the whole thing, but there's some major takeaways from that. Again, starting with why, speaking to that emotional part of the brain, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the brain research throughout this presentation. Um, Simon Sinek really leaves us with this concept of people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. 
He also later in the talks talks a lot about Dr. Martin Luther King, right? A great leader of our time. And he says, you know, Dr. King did not have the, I have a 10 point plan speech, right? Or let me tell you all the details. It was, I have a dream speech, right? It was visionary. It talked about greener pastures ahead. It was, it gave a sense of hope. It told us why this mattered for us as a society, right? And so we could learn from that as leaders, like how can we be visionary? How can we sh show the better future? How can we talk about why this is good for us? Not all the details of what it will do. So as a change leader, I wanna encourage you to start with why, work from the inside out. The why provides the motivation. The what is the specifics of the product of what we're offering, the how's the process, and those are important to get to. People do want details, but you must first start with that why so they know why they should even listen further and why you're considering this. Um, Albert Einstein, right, another one of the great thinkers of our time, tells us that the significant problem we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. And so as a change leader, we must recognize that doing what we've done and leading to just incremental changes isn't gonna always get us there. Sometimes we need to look to transformational change or what I like to refer to as a paradigm shift. Um, it's the Olympic season right now. I think we're all, you know, a year late, 2021 games. I know I'm very excited about the Olympics. Um, and this is one of my favorite Olympic stories from the 1968 Olympics. And it's the story of Dick Fosbury and the Fosbury flop, which was an absolute game-changing paradigm shift in the world of high jump. Let's take a look. The 1968 Olympic Games proved to be a turning point in the history of the high jump event. Into the Mexico City Olympic Arena came not only a new name to the sport, but a new approach, which was to revolutionize the high jump event. Dick Fosbury from the United States demonstrated a new style of high jump, which some considered strange and awkward. It was a jump he had devised in the previous years, and one which unsettled his opponents. While the crowd at first saw him as a novelty, his continued success at clearing the ever-increasing height soon made it apparent he was a serious contender. Valentin Gavrilov, from the Soviet Union, failed at his attempt of 2.22 meters, while Fosbury and his US teammate Edward Carruthers cleared their way to a jump off. The bar sat at 2.24. Carruthers failed, and Fosbury took his new style of high jump over the bar and into the history books. Fosbury had won his gold. Within a few years, the Fosbury flop had become the standard method of jumping in this great Olympic sport. So the Fosbury flop, right? A perfect example of changing your sport, right? And not just incrementally changing it, but transformational change, a complete paradigm shift. And if you think about the diffusion of innovation, he was an innovator, right? And then he was followed by some early adopters that said, hey, this looks like a good approach. He just got gold with it, I'm gonna give it a try. And then eventually they jumped that chasm into early majority and it was all downhill from there. And now it is the standard of practice. And so as a leader, sometimes you need to make transformational change by doing things completely different. I like this quote, this idea that all significant breakthroughs were break with old ways of thinking and old ways of doing things. So as a leader, sometimes you need to look to transformational change. If you've plateaued, if you reached a ceiling or you're sensing a change in your marketplace, that's the time to make that paradigm shift and move to transformational change instead of incremental change. Change isn't easy though. It's easier to talk about, but much harder to do. And part of that is because there are many challenges that you experience, many phenomenons that you face during the change process. And one of those is the implementation dip. And what that means is, as you step into the change, oftentimes your results will diminish in the short term. And it takes a while to actually improve and increase and get better to that desired state. Your goal as the leader, is to reduce the length of the dip, specifically the timing, how long you're in that dip phase, and the depth of the dip, like how bad the dip is, how much your results are impacted as you work your way to that desired performance. The myth is that change is introduced, 
you see this star here on the screen, change is introduced and immediately things get better. But that's not often the case. In most cases, there's a dip and it takes a little time to make that transition to the new model. And that's why so many change initiatives fail. People get in the dip and they're afraid of it and they jump back, right back into their old way of doing things because it was working better. But you actually need to know the dip's coming and see your way through it. And as a leader, if you know there's an implementation dip with any change, and if you talk to your employees about it, even more important, if it becomes part of your culture, part of a shared understanding, then people just know, hey, we're gonna have an implementation dip and that's okay, and we're gonna work our way through it. Nothing is seamless. When people tell me something's gonna be seamless, I always question it because no change is seamless. There is always a dip, but as a leader, it's your job to help make your employees and customers aware of that and then work your way as quickly as possible through that dip. All right, I wanna share another kind of personal analogy about change and how we deal with the taste of change, right? Change isn't always something that we love. Um, so this is a personal story. Um, this mouthwash um, was something that my wife picked up, right? She's always looking for these healthy items. It's the natural dentist, it's with aloe and all these other natural items. And um, was checking it out, it was on the bathroom counter, I was out of my regular mouthwash. And so um, I decided I would kind of check it out and give it a try. Well, here's what it looks like. And as you could see, right, it's kind of green. It doesn't look super appetizing. It looks very different than my regular mouthwash. And so again, that change, I was, I was pretty much, I had that kind of bad taste of change in my mouth of like, oh, I don't want to try this. Um, but eventually I said, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. And my response was much like this guy's, right? You know, oh, what is that? That is so different. I do not like how different that is. And I thought to myself, you know, I just want to go back to my regular old bright blue crest, what I'm always used to, because that does the trick for me and I like it, right? I'm comfortable with it. And that's the thing with change is when we're comfortable, we often don't want to try new things. But that element, that container of natural dentist sat there on the bathroom counter for a while. And if you know anything about me, you know that my family is all depression era immigrants. As such, um, it's been really passed down to us as um, next generations that you, nothing goes to waste. You know, you finish your plate. I'm the guy that like cuts open the toothpaste to get that last toothbrush out of there. You know, the, the last opportunity to brush my teeth. So I saw it there and I was feeling like it was going to waste. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna try this again. And so there it was, that kind of green color. And I tried it again and it was like, oh, I don't love it much. And I just started using it. And I don't know when it happened. It wasn't any one day, but all of a sudden I was like, this is kind of refreshing. I like this, this is good for me. And suddenly what seemed so different just a month before was now commonplace. And I ended up going and ordering a three pack on Amazon. And I'm, I'm telling people that I'm working with, it's like, have you tried this stuff? It's great for you, you should give it a try. And so again, at first we may not like that taste of change, right? We're comfortable, we're creatures of habit. And so we need to think about how can we get these early adopters to try this new thing, try it again and again, um, because eventually we might find out that not only will we like it, but it's good for us as well. So as you look to embark on the change journey, there's some major questions that you must first ask before change occurs. The first question is, what is my path to make this change? Right? Again, we talked about the, the equation of change and that F first steps, right? What are my first steps? What's my, what's my vision, the V? And what is the F, the first steps? What is my path to make change? Secondly, is it possible? I mean, does it seem doable? It doesn't mean I know how to get there. It doesn't mean I have the resources to get there, but it, it is something that is actually doable out there in the future. If so, I'm gonna give that a try. Does it fit with the mission of the organization? Don't just do change for change sake. It must be a benefit to your organization. It must move you forward with where you're trying to head. This next one I think is really important. Will it fit on a t-shirt? Basically what I'm saying is, is it simple enough that your employees, your fellow leaders, your customers, that they will all understand why you're doing it and why it will bring you to a better place. One example with this was um, with the US's uh, and NASA's effort to put a man on the moon. Um, this is a famous story from a visit 
to um, the Space Coast by President John F. Kennedy. Um, he was touring the Space Center and he walked by a janitor that was doing some cleaning and he asked the janitor, he said, what, am I, what, what are you doing? And the janitor, janitor responded, I'm putting a man on the moon, right? So this janitor clearly understood he was part of this larger vision and that his role was part of something much bigger. And so anytime your vision could fit on a t-shirt, right? I mean, his task he was doing wasn't putting a man on the moon, but the vision was very clear to him. It could fit on the t-shirt. We're getting a man on the moon and all of us have a role to play in that. This is a useful rule about vision. Um, this comes from John Cotter in Leading Change, which is one of the foremost change leadership articles. Um, definitely encourage you to give it a read. And he says, whenever you cannot describe the vision driving a change initiative in five minutes or less and get a reaction that signifies both understanding and interest, you are in trouble. Does it fit on a t-shirt? Is it compelling? Does it give me a sense of hope? Is it exciting? You know, do I, does, it, does it give me all the feels? Your vision must do that. So let's say you outline this vision, then what? How do you keep moving forward as a change leader? Well, let me tell you the major currency in the change process is two-way communication. And I'm emphasizing purposely two-way communication, right? So as a leader, you must share that vision. You must tell the stories of how it, this change will be better. You must share and remind folks of their current dissatisfaction with the status quo. But that's just the one-way part. The two-way is listening to people's concerns. What are their hopes? What are their fears, right? What are their suggestions, right? Hearing from them. And it can't just be you as the leader. You need ambassadors with you. Um, you need members of a guiding coalition helping tell the story of why this change is necessary and how to do it. So let's talk a little bit about some elements of change management. There's a lot here. I'll share this resource with you. What we know is that there's many different individuals in an organization, roles that they take on during change. We have folks that like to take on the role of the critic. We'll tell you why this will never work, why it's a bad idea. There's other folks that will take on the role of the victim. This is hurting me, this is giving me more work, this is de-emphasizing my work, this isn't working for me. We have the bystander. They're kind of the just bystander. They're just watching. They're like, you know, I'm going to try and stay away from that change thing for a while. I don't really like that. And then finally, we have the navigator. And as a leader, you want to identify change navigators in your organization. You want to hire for change navigators because it's not something that you could always train on. Many people are much more comfortable with change than others. And you want to look for that in the hiring process but you also wanna call on these change navigators. The change navigator is trying to understand how will this impact me? What will be new? What are the opportunities of this change? That's an employee that is a change navigator. You want to identify them, you want to hire them, you want to cultivate them, you want to reinforce their behavior, you wanna recognize and celebrate their behavior because that's what you want to build in this organization. So I wanna share with you um, a brief overview of some change management tools. Let's take a look.
so a lot of takeaways in there. Um, I want to reemphasize a couple of them, right? Again, this idea of minimizing uncertainty, whenever and wherever you can, minimize uncertainty. Now, with that said, change is amb ambiguous and people aren't always comfortable with that. But if you could share information to minimize that uncertainty, you'll be the better for it. Keep explaining time and time again why are we changing. And don't just explain in a single email and think you're done. You need to put out a video. You need to go talk to people. You need to have two-way conversations. Communication is necessary to continue again and again and again. Also, keep listening. Keep listening. What are the concerns? And finally, the one I really want to emphasize is communicate the threat of not changing. If we don't change, what will be the problem? What will be the results? Really remind folks of the dissatisfaction with the status quo. That's part of the change formula. All right, next I want to talk about leading change. This is John Cotter's work, right? This was seminal work. Kind of one of those top 10 change leadership reads. You must read it. Leading Change, Why Transformation Efforts Fail, originally published in the Harvard Business Review. This is part of kind of the core change leadership work. And the thing I want to highlight that Cotter shares is these eight steps to transforming your organization. It's not like this is a perfect linear path that you do step one and then you close that up and you go on to step two and you close that up. But these are eight things that you need to be considering and doing as a change leader. So let's take a look. The first one is establishing that sense of urgency, communicating the threat of not changing, identifying that dissatisfaction with the status quo. There is a sense of urgency around this. We need to do this now. It cannot wait. Second, forming that powerful guiding coalition. Who's going to help inform me? Who are the voices that are going to inform my decisions? Who are going to be my key ambassadors and co-leaders on this project? Get that guiding coalition, folks that have a strong reputation for the area you're trying to change and a strong reputation in your organization. Create a vision. The vision is critical. You must have that vision to show the hope, to show how things will be better, to show why we'll need this. Communicate that vision. It's not simply enough that you hold that vision and that you have clarity on the vision as a change leader, but you must communicate that vision time and time again. Do not let any opportunity to communicate the vision pass, right? Don't just assume you gave a speech on it, you shared it once, you're done. Use every opportunity you have, every interaction to communicate and reinforce that vision. And use your guiding coalition to do that with you. Empower others to act on the vision. And this is critical because as a change leader, you can't do it all, nor should you. So if you set the vision, you get others bought into the vision, empower them to act on that vision so they could take steps. Um, he talks about getting rid of obstacles to change. I often like to say as a leader, I'm kind of doing downfield blocking. Like I love a good sports metaphor, right? My job is to remove barriers, do blo downfield blocking, help set it up so my employees and my other leaders can make progress toward that change and get action done. Plan for and create short-term wins. This is critical. Many change initiatives are multi-year efforts. And if you're doing a multi-year effort, people will lose steam, especially if you're in that implementation dip and it feels like it's not going as well. They'll wanna throw in the towel. They'll wanna go back to their place of comfort. So you need to plan ahead and create short-term wins and you need to celebrate those along the way. Celebrate. The, the first step being completed. Celebrate a key milestone in the project. Celebrate the members of the team that got us here, right? That celebration is critical to moving forward with the change process. Consolidate improvements and produce still more changes. So change doesn't always happen in one fell swoop. Sometimes you make that change and then you start to work it in to the organization and then you continue to innovate on top of that, right? And at the end of the day, you need to institutionalize these new approaches because you can't always be in a change process. At some point, this change needs to become part of your organization's DNA. It needs to become part of what you do. And you need to make sure that you have strong processes in place to allow that to move forward without a lot of work because we all know there is initiative fatigue in our organizations. And if you're constantly in change initiative mode, um, you'll have that initiative fatigue. So you do need to 
um, you know, really put the process to bed. And so that's the biggest mistake that many change leaders make is they make the initial change and they think they're done and they get excited and they want to move on to that next change. But you actually need somebody, especially if you're a visionary like me, you need somebody kind of coming along, I would say behind you, but really alongside of you that says that's going to put all these pieces together and make sure that it's deeply implemented in your organization before you move on to that next big idea. So I want to share another leadership model with you. This is from the Leadership Challenge by the authors Kuz and Posner, who are leadership consultants and thought leaders out of Santa Clara University. And they talk about these five practices of exemplary leadership. And they're not talking about change leadership specifically, but in, in, it's my belief in order to do change leadership, you need to be practicing these um, exemplary leadership approaches. So there's five of them. Let's, let's hit them here one at a time. First, model the way for your colleagues, your employees, your customers, and others. You need to demonstrate what you're trying to do. You need to actually not just say it with your words, but show it with your actions. So finding your voice, making sure you clarify your values, where we're going, set that example, model the way as a change leader. Inspire a shared vision. Again, what is a shared vision? Not just share, sharing your personal vision, but in listing others to create this ideal image of what the organization can be or of where we're trying to go. Again, that sense of hope, future, optimism. Inspire that shared vision and make sure that it's not just your personal vision, but it's a vision that's shared amongst your other leaders, your stakeholders, your customers. Moving on, challenge the process. We know specifically in the role of change leadership, you need to abandon the status quo at time to seek innovative ways to improve. You need to be able to step aside from we've always done it this way and be comfortable entering that implementation dip and maybe taking some step backwards, maybe failing sometimes, right, um, to get to the next step and get to that improvement. Again, enable others to act. You want to foster that collaboration. You want to ensure that you've now set this vision but you're giving folks enough room to live in and work into that vision and take action toward that vision. And finally, encourage the heart. Recognize the contribution of others and celebrate their accomplishments. Celebrate those milestone wins along the way, but really speak to that emotional center. Like, why are we doing this? Why will this make us a better organization? How will this improve our world? right? Speak to those things because that's what compels people to do the difficult work. And I think what you'll see between both those last two that we've shared um, is there's a lot of, there's some similarities, right? About vision and um, encouraging others to act and moving away from the status quo. And so again, what you need to find as a change leader is which of these elements are most compelling to me and how do I apply them in my day-to-day -day work? So I want to get into a couple more specifics. And again, you're going to notice some repetition and that's purposeful because there's a lot of different approaches but there's these common themes that come up time and time again in the change leadership literature so leading change in an organization what is the leader's role during change well you need to make that business case for change why are we doing this how will this make us better better communicate those risks of not changing educate your employees on how their work will change and what will be different for them you need to be visible and accessible during a change initiative, right? People want to be able to see you. They want to see you modeling the way. They want to be accessible to you. They want you to hear from them. Um, you need to continue to be an ambassador for that change. Stay optimistic and upbeat about the change and be the keeper of the vision. Keep reminding the vision. Keep telling the story of the vision. You also need ambass ambassadors. These could be fellow leaders. These could be employees who are change navigators. Um, these could be somebody key in your organization, your community, your board. And they're, in essence, the PR team for the project, right? They are also making the business case for change. They're sharing that vision. They're taking part in that two-way communication. But they're sharing for folks what this project will mean for them. Why is it compelling? Again, speaking to that emotional center, encouraging the heart. What do you need from your employees during change? You need them to recognize that change does happen, right? We want them to seek information and answers, right? We want them to not be a bystander, but be an active participant, to engage, to be a change navigator, to know where they're at, 
to be aware that there will be an implementation dip and be comfortable with that. And hopefully step back and see the big picture when possible. All right, I do want to acknowledge that this is all easier said than done. And why is that? It's because emotional contagion, right? Something that spreads like wildfire through organizations, teams, nations, societies, families. And what emotional contagion is, is when you take on the feelings of those around you. And so if those around you are feeling fear or anxiety about change, it's very commonplace that that same feeling could could take over many folks within the organization, right? As humans, we have an open system that feels what's around us and oftentimes will take on those feelings. It's what allows us to be empathetic. Um, so it's, it's a great skill. It's not something we want to get rid of as humans, um, but it does create challenges for us during the change process, right? So there is this intersection of emotional contagion with change because change typically leads to uncertainty, anxiety, fear, right? And again, you could see emotional contagion down at the smallest group all the way up to the organization, even in a nation or a society, this emotional contagion phenomena. Um, so what is one way that you help navigate emotional contagion as a leader? I would contend to you it's through the use of emotional intelligence. So I want to talk to you about another resource here called Primal Leadership. This is Daniel Goleman and others' work, um, but Daniel Goleman was really the, seen as the father of emotional intelligence. And some things that we know from this is that these bad emotions are sticky. They really stay with us. They last longer. Um, and so we have to overcompensate with more positivity, more sto sto stories of hope, more reinforcing successes, more telling people thank you and celebrating their good work, right? Um, it's, hard, it's hard to fix bad emotions, so it's much easier if you're, as a leader, if you're positive, if you exude upbeat feelings, because those are contagious. And there's actually science behind this. So I want to talk about a little bit of brain research that informs this work. So we know about the limbic system. It's our emotional center. Right? It's an open loop system, meaning that emotions are highly contagious and that we feed off the feelings of another. That's why if you've ever been in a board meeting and somebody yawns and all of a sudden everyone's yawning, right? Um, the infectious laughter, right? We know that. So um, the same way that it goes with good feelings, it could also go with negative feelings. Um, and we need to be mindful of that limbic system because it really goes back to an evolutionary um, tool for us, right? It, it was a lot of our fight or flight syndrome, right? You would hear somebody be afraid or scream and that would cue you to be afraid because you needed to, in that moment, decide, do I need to fight or do I need to take flight? Now, um, in 2021, I'm not sure that our limbic system is always doing us good, right? Many times it's, we're taking on that fear or anxiety of other places. We do have that somewhat balanced by our prefrontal cortex, which is our cognitive center. And sometimes it could veto these emotional impulses and say, wait, I don't really have a good reason to be afraid of that. I'm, I'm overreacting or no, I shouldn't respond in a fight syndrome on that, right? I'm not really in danger here. Um, but as a leader, it's important to know that these are things that we all have as humans. And there is this open loop system where members of your organization, of your team, are gonna be feeding off the feelings of others, be it good or bad. And so you want to try and bring in those positive feelings, those feelings of hope, those feelings of we could do this, those feelings of being upbeat. Um, I wanna share one example here of the open loop system in action. Let's take a look. Ha 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 ha!
<laughs> so hopefully that got you smiling, if not laughing, um, as you're watching it. As you can see, that open loop system, right? We respond to the feelings around us. Um, there's also this element of the first follower in there where, you know, the individual's laughing, a couple of folks are looking around like, is this okay? Is this funny? And then once a couple of folks start laughing, then it just takes off like wildfire, right? Again, it's that emotional contagion. And so as a leader, this is very important to know, especially during change leadership. So as a leader, what should you do, right? You can't just always speak to emotions, but what we know is you also can't always just speak to intellect, right? Um, Simon Sinek reminded us to start with why, start with that emotional compelling message, and then work our way out. And so as a reminder, as a leader, it's your job to shape your team's emotions. Um, you're a magnet and you'll attract people with your energy, and especially if you're optimistic, sense of hope, upbeat, positive. Um, you wanna manage the meaning of what's happening, tell the story of your why, right? And again, as I've said before, Every interaction is an opportunity to share that vision, to share a positive reinforcer, to share a little positive emotional contagion. So if I could leave you with only one thing from this, and it's a very critical takeaway, it's that the leader's energy is infectious. I'll say it again. The leader's energy is infectious. And so whatever you're bringing to the table that day, regardless of how hard your morning was or what you had to deal with in your last meeting, that will be infectious to your team. And so make sure that you're trying to bring your best self forward and that you're coming ready with that upbeat feeling, this we can do it, uh, a sense of playfulness, um, reinforcing that vision, right? Because the leader's energy is absolutely infectious. First, personal leadership. There's these four dimensions of emotional intelligence. And under the area of personal leadership, there's my self-management, how am I managing my own emotions and my response to the challenges and the feedback I face. Secondly, my self-awareness. Am I aware of how others perceive me? Am I aware of the impact of my words and my behaviors? And this all is in that kind of personal competence. So these four elements of emotional intelligence, sharing the first two here, self-management and self-awareness, um, again, these are very critical during the change process and specifically when you're in an instance of emotional contagion. Then there's really the organizational leadership. You need to have social awareness. Right? What are the dynamics at play in this organization? Who's who? Like who's influential? Who feels this way? Having some awareness of how your employees feel and also who your ambassadors are. And then relationship management the fourth quadrant of emotional intelligence. You must manage relationships. If the emotional bank account is drained, you can't keep asking for things without making deposits back into that emotional bank account with the organization, with a team, with an individual. Making sure that you're managing those re um, relationships, and that's really the social competence side. And so as leaders, I want to encourage you to really look into emotional intelligence, do a self-assessment of emotional intelligence, because these emotional intelligence tools, I think are critical as a leader in a change leadership situation. So one final thing I wanna leave you with is this idea that leadership is not a one size fits all approach, right? There's not one type of leadership that you use all the time and it'll always be successful. Now, it is my hope that you have some key takeaways about the implementation dip, or the importance of a first follower, or reminding yourself to start with why, or speaking to that emotional center, right? So there are some takeaways that we hope you take away from this presentation, and specifically that idea that the leader's energy is infectious. But I also want to remind you that there are many styles of leadership, and they all have a place and time. Um, this infographic here I'm sharing is based on Goldman's work of primal leadership, and it identifies six different styles of leadership. And it talks about some of the benefits of each style and some of the cons of each style and when to use them. And what I want you to do as a change leader, or what I wanna encourage you to do as a change leader, is to have all these styles of leadership in your tool belt and realize which ones you're best at and which ones are appropriate to use and when. I typically try and be a visionary leader, but when I'm in crisis, 
I may need to go into a more commanding authoritative style leadership if there's a crisis or an emergency in my organization. So I wanna compare these styles a little bit. Um, so some of them are more resonant than others. So resonance is this process when you're an emotionally intelligent leader and you're creating resonance, good feelings between you and those who you're trying to lead. And so they identify visionary leadership as one of the most resonant styles of leadership. It's got a high concern for people, but also a high concern for results. And so I try and stay in that visionary leadership quadrant. But I do realize that sometimes you may have to go into a commanding leader. Like I said, if you're in a, an immediate crisis and somebody just needs to be making decisions. Or sometimes you do need to go into pace setting leadership. You have a key deadline to meet. It's critical for the organization. The organization will fail without it. Sometimes you need to go into that pace setting, but you can't stay in them for too long because you'll see they'll eventually create dissonance in negative feelings. But as opposed to coaching, democratic, visionary, those will be much more resonant, much more positive feelings with your employees. So I wanna encourage you to do that. Finally, just remember, these are all tools in your tool belt and you're not doing all of them at once but there is always a time for any of them, right? There's always a time when that style of leadership is the right approach. So it's my hope that this change leadership presentation was informative for you, that you took away some approaches to facilitate change, that you have a better understanding of the change process and the role of the leaders and what feelings and emotions your employees might be facing. Um, hopefully I encourage you to embark on some transformational change, find your own Fosbury flop and make that paradigm shift. Um, but with all that said, I will leave you with this one final thing that I always have to remind myself and I want to remind you to be a good leader. And this is actually an African proverb. It has stood the test of time. And it tells you, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. It's been my pleasure.